Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of the witnesses who have joined us uh, both here today and remotely, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk about an issue that's uh, extremely important to everybody. Uh, I think another disaster that the chairman talked about in Texas and similar weather-related outages in the past few years have revealed two major challenges to the electric sector that policymakers must address. One is most certainly reliability. We need to ensure our energy systems are resilient to the impacts such as extreme weather, storms, um, wildfires, or cyber attacks. If an emergency occurs, we want to make sure that any of those impacts are minimized and are remedied quickly. The other is affordability. Building and maintaining a power system, especially with innovative technologies, comes at a price. We need to make sure we are not making it unaffordable to turn on those lights, especially during and after an external challenge to grid reliability. Um, and also for those, uh, those who are in the lower and, and low mid incomes where the higher cost of utilities are particularly uh, difficult to manage. I would suggest there are two key strategies that this committee can support to advance these related goals. First, we need an all of the above energy strategy. Clean energy is not just wind and solar power. It includes nuclear energy, low carbon natural gas, hydropower, geothermal, battery storage, and electricity generated conventionally from fuels like coal with innovative technologies, such as carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration. Fuel diversity will pay dividends in addressing reliability by providing the flexibility to switch sources if one generation becomes unavailable. Despite the progress some may seek to recite Despite the progress some may seek to ignore, American emissions have steadily decreased in the power sector over the last decade, while global emissions have risen, especially in China. As of 2019, carbon dioxide emissions from the power sector have decreased by 33% since 2005, and 2017 marked the ninth time this century that the U.S. reduced emissions more than any other nation thanks primarily to the revolution in domestic natural gas production. We need to continue to build up America's energy leadership and invest in innovation and in innovative ways, which directly ties in with a the theme I've mentioned before. We can't build back better if we can't build anything at all. While general oversight of the grid is not within the committee's jurisdiction, proper permitting absolutely is. Certainty in permitting and consistency of regulations is essential for building the relevant infrastructure to achieve our goals of reliability and affordability. For too long, states and project sponsors have been stuck in a regulatory purgatory, seeking endless approvals from up to 13 different federal agencies. Additionally, dozens of state and local approvals are typically required before construction. Building on the streamlining provisions enacted under Title 41 of the FAST Act and the creation of the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council, the one federal decision policy called for early coordination and predictable timelines to deliver decisions in a timely manner without compromising any environmental protections. However, one federal decision was revoked under one of President Biden's first actions in office when he signed Executive Order 13990. It will be hard to deliver on clean energy if permitting complexity represents an unsurmountable challenge. As one example, new wind and solar projects are often constructed hundreds of miles from consumers, far from existing transmission lines, to move that electricity where it is needed. Without the ability to timely permit new transmission the ambitious goal set by President Biden of zero emissions by 2035 is just a co costly pipe dream. If there was any doubt as to the path my Democrat friends want us to think about, I think if we look at what's happened, and I see my colleague here from California, and I'm really pleased that we have Mayor Garcetti on the, on the panel because I want to look at what's specifically going on in the city of Los Angeles. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in January, Los Angeles households paid 52.2% more 
for electricity than the nationwide av average in the same month. And that's despite LA's famously beautiful and milder weather. Um, this is nearly 7% more than Los Angeles paid last January. So the trend is going in the wrong direction uh, on affordability for the City of Angels. On reliability, according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration in 2019, the average American lost power for approximately 4.7 hours, including as a result of extreme weather events like floods, blizzards, and hurricanes. In California, also in 2019, customers had 9.78 hours without power, which is more than a five-hour difference, which doesn't sound like much, but when you look at it a percentage wise, it's double, double the amount of time. Wildfires and controlled outages aren't the only blame. Outages in non-fire months were also up compared to 2018. And Los Angeles led the way with 5,787 blackouts in the year 2019, impacting more than 6.4 million customers. Goes to my re reliability premise. This is before ambitious plans to electrify transmission and to shutter the state's remaining nuclear plants and pressure its, put pressure on its natural gas plants. I noticed that the mayor is going to be closing, I think it said three natural gas plants. So California, its demand for power and lack of generation stresses the systems also of their neighboring states. For now, it looks like things will continue to go in that direction in California, and I suggest that we can do it a better way for the rest of the country. But I don't agree, disagree with everything that the mayor uh, has put forward. In his testimony, he hit on my other premise of where I think we ne need to go. I was very pleased to see and hope to engage him uh, on to see that he is very interested in the permit streamlining uh, aspect of uh, getting uh, cleaner energy to every household. This is certainly I, something I agree with him on and I believe should be a priority for our committee. So I thank the chairman and I would like to take a moment uh, should I introduce my West Virginian, or should I wait to do that, Mr. Chairman? Why do you go ahead right now? Okay. Never a bad time to introduce a West Virginian, that's for sure, um, as you know. So I want to thank all the witnesses here, and I want to thank particularly uh, Jim Wood for coming or for being here to join us to testify. Jim Wood is the director of the Inter Energy Institute at West Virginia University, where he also serves as director of the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center Advanced Coal Technology Consortium. In 2019, Mr. Wood was appointed by our governor, Jim Justice, to his downstream jobs task force. The task force is working to bring manufacturing opportunities to the state ahead of the anticipated expansion of the petrochemical industry in Appalachia. Additionally, Jim has 30 years of experience in the power industry. He came to West Virginia University in 2014 from Thermo Energy Corp, where he was chairman, president, and CEO of the Massachusetts-based company focused on industrial wastewater treatment and power generation technologies. Prior to that, um, Jim, prior to WVU, Jim was D Deputy Assistant Secretary of DOE's Office of Clean Coal for President Obama, and he was responsible for a $4.5 billion program for research and demonstration projects related to carbon capture and storage, advanced power generation cycles, fuel cells, and advanced integrated gas combined cycle processes. I'm really happy to have Jim. I've re relied on him as an expert for me to help me. We're happy to have him in West Virginia at WVU, and we're really pleased to have him in the committee today. Thank you.